but I'm really happy to be here. And uh, there were a few things that I wish I would have said. I was totally uh, surprised, by the way, by um, being recognized by this organization. And, uh, you know, I wasn't preparing, like, for the Academy Awards. I didn't have my remarks and all my thank yous ready. Um, but the fact is there are a few things, uh, more things that I would like to say before I start, start the substantive discussion. A and um, I'm so glad that Catherine Carpenter, who, by the way, is one of our board members, if I can be shameless there in uh, promoting her and the organization. And the, the fact is that um, we have a lot of work to do. And certainly one of my highest goals is to get rid of the case Smith versus Doe. We need to overturn that terrible decision. And um, I don't know if I am going to be the attorney that argues before the US Supreme Court. I can only hope in my wildest dreams that I would be. But I'm willing to carry the briefcase of the person who does do it. And. Uh, <laughs> Just in case it's me, um, I did get admitted to the U.S. Supreme Court bar uh, in June of this year. So I'm a... <laughs> Thank you. I, I am a Girl Scout. I am a lifetime Girl Scout. It may be the decision that they regret, but the fact is that I'm a lifetime Girl Scout, and uh, I am a former Girl Scout leader. And um, I believe in being prepared. They taught me to be prepared. And so that's one of the things I did. Uh, one of the funny stories is after getting admitted to the US Supreme Court, I realized that although I was already a member of every district court, US district court in California, and we have four of them, I hadn't bothered to be admitted to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the court between them. <laughs> and so I've taken care of that problem, too. So now they don't have any excuses um, not to listen to me. Um, other than they don't want to. Okay, so um, um, as my slides will reflect, and I'm glad that they were found, um, I used to be I, the founder, I still am the founder, and I used to be the president of California Reform Sex Offender Laws, and uh, there's been a shift in the name change, and so we are now the Alliance for Constitutional Sex Offense Laws. There's many reasons for that, and I won't go into them right now, but the fact is we're doing the same thing. Okay, what we used to do, we're still doing now. Um, we, uh, you know, on our board, thinking about what we were doing, we're just like, you know, we're just not comfortable with the sex offender title in there. That was part of our reasoning. And we thought that when you use the term sex offender, which we try to not use, by the way, instead use registrant or registered citizen, um, because I do believe, like Catherine, that language is important, that we wanted, to, we wanted to focus on the offense, or the law, actually, rather than on the individual who might have been convicted of uh, a sex offense. But it's not the emphasis wasn't on that person. It was the laws that needed to be changed and not the individual. So that, in fact, it explains part of our name change. So having said that, and I think, uh, are we ready for live streaming? OK, I'll go ahead and start. International Megan's Law. That's what this panel is about. And if you have a question about IML, myself and my co-presenter here, Paul Rigney, will be willing to answer questions at the end of our presentation. So I'm going to ask you not to interrupt what I have to say. And then, um, but we'll, there should be plenty of time for Q&A later. I mean, we have an hour and a half for this, for this gathering, OK? And we will answer questions specific to countries. Actually, that's Paul's job. I'm going to talk about the law itself. I'm going to talk about the regulation. I'll also talk a little bit about the lawsuit um, that we filed challenging the law. So uh, here we go. Um, it's important for you to know a little bit about the background of the International Megan's Law. And trust me, I could expound for hours, and I'm going to prevent myself from doing that if possible. If not, you can just give me the sign. Um, but the fact is, I think you need to know that Christopher Smith from New Jersey had, in fact, introduced International Megan's Law many years in a row. And uh, the latest version was H.R. 515. That means House of Representatives Bill 515. And the fact is that for many years, his bill went nowhere. So when you have a bill in front of Congress, it has to int be introduced in one uh, body, and it has to be, and then passed. And then the other body has to pass it as well, OK? And for the longest time, Chris Smith from New Jersey, and by the way, he represents the district where Megan Kanka was killed, and her family still lives there, and so this is his calling card, is International Megan's Law. So in January of 2015, when he introduced the bill one more time, I yawned. 
I really did. And people like pulling on my sleeve, Janice, Janice, he did it again. I was like, oh, it's just Chris Smith being Chris Smith. It's not going to go anywhere because the Senate never picked it up. And you can't have a new, you can't create a law unless both houses of Congress, in fact, pass it. But on December 17th, when the Senate took up the bill, the House version of the bill, and then they amended the bill, that got my attention. Okay, so the fact that the Senate picked up the bill at all, all of a sudden is on my radar screen. And number two, that terrible amendment that they added really got my attention. And I said, excuse the expression, oh shit. December 17th, that's eight days before Christmas. I don't know what I was planning to do for Christmas, but what I did was prepare a lawsuit. Because at that point in time, it became very obvious that this, the skids were greased and we're going to have a law. Okay. We tried to stop it, by the way, and Paul and his group did a really good job. They actually went to D.C. They met with uh, members of the Congress and tried to stop this bill from becoming law, from being passed in both houses. But again, it was very obvious that the skids were greased. And I'll tell you one way I know that, because in both houses, they considered the bill under the suspension of rules. Yawn, who cares? But I'll tell you what that means is there are no committee referrals, there was no discussion, and there was no debate. And for our country to consider for the very first time that they are going to add a unique identifier to a citizen's passports, it just chills my blood saying it to you right now. And I've had a long time dealing with this. But you've got to be kidding me. We're not going to, as a nation, give some consideration, serious consideration. How about some discussion and debate about doing something for the first time in the history of our country? There was nothing. And I do mean nothing. So December 17th, the Senate passed it. And then because the Senate passed a different version than the House, it had to go back to the House. And so in the House, again, the skids were greased. And so February 8th, the House considered the bill, uh, uh, yeah, this year, and boom, it was, I'm sorry, February 1st, it was done. What happened on February 8th, one week later, is the president signed the bill on February 8th. That's how much time he took to consider the bill, too. And again, nobody is discussing, nobody is giving any thought to the fact this was a historic piece of legislation. The suspension of rules for any legislation, and so I'm a former congressional staffer, I'm a former federal lobbyist, I know these things, right? And when you do that, it's, the bill's supposed to be non-controversial. And by the way, they packaged it with some non-controversial bills. Okay, so they stuck it right in the smack dab middle, middle. I think there were six bills going forward under suspension of the rules. And the rest of them were not controversial, but this one was very controversial. It didn't get any discussion. It didn't get any debate. And that's wrong. I don't know. Okay, so um, when they went to the House of Representatives, there was one lone member of the House who dissented. His name is Bobby Scott, and he's from Virginia. And Bobby Scott is one of my heroes now. And so I know you're from Virginia, right? And I hope you know Bobby Scott, who in fact is a, a civil rights attorney and uh, was one before he became a member of Congress. And he spoke out against it. So we had one lone voice. And when I say there was no discussion, no debate, on the floor, when it's being voted upon, people can come in and say a few words, like they have these one-minute speeches and everything. Most of the time that was spent on the floor was people patting their, themselves on the back. Look at this wonderful thing that we're doing today. But the other, by the way, another thing about suspension of the rules is votes are then taken orally. Right? There's no record of who voted for it. By the way, there's supposed to be a quorum before the vote is taken. There's no record of whether or not there was a quorum, and there probably wasn't in any of the cases. Does this happen on a fairly regular basis? Yes. But, and it's like, oh, yawn, except when it's our bill, right? And so, again, on September fir uh, February 1st, um, the House passed the Senate version of the bill. The President signed the bill one week later, and I want to tell you, we were ready. So the very next day after the President signed the bill, we filed a lawsuit. So we have challenged the international Megan's Law, and we've said it's unconstitutional. We've used many different <laughs> arguments. Substantive due process is one of them. We also argued ex post facto, you know, violation of the 14th Amendment. I mean, we, we just threw it all in there. 
we already had our plaintiffs. We have seven plaintiffs in the case. And there are a wide range of spectrum of, of people. Uh, one man doesn't have a passport. And we said, but you're harming him too because he won't be able to get a passport that doesn't identify him as, okay? And, um, and in the lawsuit, one of the big arguments that the government and our side is having is what is the meaning of something being added to the passport, this unique identifier, what's the meaning? And so the argument that the government's throwing back at us is, we're just stating a fact that this person's been convicted of a sex offense. Now, if that were true, maybe I wouldn't have as much problem with it, but that's not true, okay? That's a fact, okay, because they're saying that they're only, gonna, only going to add the unique identifier to the passports of somebody who, one, has been convicted of a sex offense involving a minor, and number two, is re currently required to register, okay? If that's all that meant, maybe I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have trouble sleeping at night. But it means more than that. And if you look at the findings of the bill, remember there were no committee hearings on this, but there are some findings in the bill, and a stated purpose of the bill is to prevent two things from happening. One of them is child sex tourism, and the other one is child sex trafficking. Okay, that's what it says it's about. So if you get that label, and this is my argument, if you had that label on your passport, this is what it means. You have engaged in, or you're likely to engage in, either child sex trafficking or child sex tourism. And as Catherine was stating you know, in her presentation earlier, we have a whole lot of people on the registry who have non-contact, non-violent offenses. The largest one is possession of child pornography. So you're concerned that because somebody looks at an image of a teenager, a naked teenager, that this person is going to run overseas and participate in child sex tourism? Well, if you're Justice Alito for the U.S. Supreme Court, it's true. Because this is what he said in oral argument on a different case, the case of Nichols. This is what Judge, Justice Alito said. The only reason anybody goes to the Philippines is to have sex with children. <laughs> Well, exactly, and Kathleen Garner over there, I believe it was Kathleen, I'm going to give, give you the credit, said, sounds like he's speaking from experience. <laughs> I don't know Justice Alito's background, but I will tell you that two of my seven plaintiffs have wives in the Philippines, and they can't get to their wives in the Philippines because of International Megan's Law, and it's precursor, by the way. So the scary thing is, there's been something going on for a while, and a, it has this nickname, Operation Angel Watch. Anybody heard of Operation Angel Watch? Okay, so for the longest time, I was really having trouble with that title, and I'm like, Operation Angel Watch? Oh, are the kids the angels? I decided no. I figured the people on the registrants are the angels, and they want to watch you, okay? <laughs> so it makes me feel better about the, about the name. But the fact is, the federal government can't even get it straight when they started Operation Angel Watch. And I've seen the year 2007, and that came out in a press release that was issued after the IML was signed by the president into law. They said, oh, yes, we've been doing that since 2007. And then some, another thing said 2010, and something else said 2011. And if they can't even get the date straight about when the program started, it just kind of makes me think they're not telling us the truth. Um, there's a few other indicators that we're not being told the truth. If, if this program was already legal that they've been doing since 2007, let's just give them, uh, let's just pick that date, um, why did they need a law? Okay, why did they need a law <coughs> to send notices to other countries if it was already legal. Do you ever think about that? It's like, huh. And, and one, we lawyers, we like to read footnotes, okay? And so when uh, my opposing counsel filed a document, she said in a footnote that they got, the U.S. Marshals Service got their authority for the Angel Watch program before IML from a certain uh, title of the U.S. Code. And I went and read it. And I'm like, well, isn't that interesting? Again, like the language from the Sixth Circuit decision, it's not a blank check. In fact, it says that our government cannot share information about our citizens unless they get two assurances. 
country by country. One, that they're going to protect the information that we send them. And two, it's only going to be used for that purpose and no other purpose. And I bet you dollars to donuts that the federal government hasn't done that to every single country to whom they're sending notices. So I can't wait to be able to conduct discovery in this case. Don't know if I'm going to get the chance. We filed in Northern District of, US, uh, of California because historically they're a liberal district. What I didn't count on was the fact that they had this little stepchild courthouse over in Oakland, which is conservative, and we got thrown over to the conservative courthouse. Very small courthouse, and I was like, damn it, there's this big court, federal court, in, district court in San Francisco, and instead of going there with all the nice liberal judges, we got thrown to the conservative court, and the judge that we ended up with, Phyllis Hamilton, is known for siding with the government, the U.S. government, on every subject. So I was like, okay, hmm, this is going to be interesting, and we never know, and supposedly these decisions are made anonymously, right? They didn't think about uh, who our cause or what we were challenging. I'm not sure I believe it, but anyway, we're in front of Phyllis Hamilton. And so one of the first things we did within 30 days is we filed a motion for a preliminary injunction. We want to stop the law from being implemented. And unfortunately, the judge did not agree with us. It wasn't a shock, but unfortunately, she didn't agree with us. And so then what happened a week later, approximately, the government filed a motion to dismiss the entire case. Okay, so our hearing was in March. She ruled in April. A week, a week later, the, the government filed a motion to dismiss the case using the very same grounds that the judge used to dismiss our, our, or to deny, rather, our motion for a preliminary injunction. There's no, that's, that's not a coincidence. Okay, they did it on purpose. Um, if we're going to get the case dismissed on procedural grounds, it's better than substantive grounds. But the fact is, it would still be a disservice. On the other hand, if we're going to be in front of an unfriendly judge, I'd rather her dismiss the case on procedural grounds and refile the case somewhere else. So if, in fact, she grants the motion to dismiss, by the way, that was filed in April. We had oral arguments in July. It's September. We still don't have a decision. The, the optimist in me thinks that the judge will, in fact, allow us to do what we want to do, which is to amend the complaint. Because I want to add, as an argument, the fact that they didn't have the authority prior to the IML to be sending these notices out. We'll see what happens. Again, if she dismisses the case, we will, in fact, file a brand new case. I'm going to probably use new plaintiffs. And I have a brand new, wonderful plaintiff who called me just the other day. And by the way, I never know literally who's going to call me. It could be Fox News. It could be, you know, somebody, the parent of a registered citizen. It could be, um, well, the president hasn't called me yet, but I'm home. <laughs> Whoever the next president might be. So the fact is that um, he called me, and so um, he he's, was convicted of a sex offense in California. He finished. Pro he was put on probation. When he finished probation, he left the country. He moved to Mexico, okay? He moved to Mexico City precisely. And he's got a business there. He's a fashion photographer. He travels all over the world. But his business is in Mexico City. And on Labor Day, he tried to go back to his business headquarters, and he was denied entry into Mexico. And he'd been traveling back and forth without a problem for years, three years anyway, and he was denied on Labor Day. He's going to make a great plaintiff, <laughs> thinking like a lawyer. Okay, um, so here we go. Then what happened um, but right before Labor Day is that the State Department actually issued a regulation that says it's implementing the International Megan's Law, but the fact is they did a really bad job of it, which I guess for us is a good thing. Um, so what we did, and let me tell you why. Um, first, they said that they, were gonna I that they were issuing a final rule, and they didn't issue a proposed rule first. So anybody here have any experience with government rulemaking, the norm is that you get a proposed rule first, the public has a ch chance to comment upon it, and then you know they can decide whether or not to change the rule. They didn't do that. And they're like, well, we don't think we need to. We're just going to issue a final rule. Well, again, I don't know if it's good or bad, but the fact is they screwed it up. So uh, procedurally, they made a mistake because they're supposed to put in the rule itself. This is the law, not Janice's opinion. The federal law says that thou must state in the final rule, if you choose not to 
issue a proposed rule first. You must put in the final rule why you didn't issue a proposed ruling. And they didn't do that. Oh, darn. Okay. Substantively, which I care even more about, is they put in there that they are not going to issue any passport cards, not passports, passport cards, to a registered citizen, a covered registered citizen. What? The IML doesn't say you can deny anything completely to a registered citizen. It doesn't say that. In fact, I brought my passport card, if anybody hasn't seen one. It just kind of looks like a credit card. I never used a darn thing, but at the time, it's like for an extra 20 bucks, you too can get a passport card. Okay, maybe I'll need to use it or want to use it someday. So that passport card has limited use. Mexico, Canada, Bermuda, and some islands. That's it. <laughs> but when the IML does not say you can deny a passport card to someone, your regulation can't say that either. The regulation cannot be broader than the law. So they made a substantive mistake there. And then the even bigger mistake they made was they used the wrong definition of covered individual. Or I think they say covered sex offender. Okay, a term that I don't like to use. But that's their language, covered sex offender. And in the IML itself, it says that if you have ever been convicted, ever, ever, ever convicted of a sex offense involving a minor, that the U.S. government has the authority to send out a notice about you to the country you're traveling. Now, some people ask, well, how are they going to know that? Right? Two ways. One, 21-day notice. Under SORNA now, and the IML specifically stated in that, 20, a minimum of a 21-day notice. So you send your 21 data to uh, notice rather to local law enforcement, they turn around and send it to the federal government. So the federal government knows precisely what flight you're on, what day, what time, etc. Okay? The other way they, they know is just in case you don't give notice, <laughs> they're tracking the international flight manifest every single day. It's like somebody must have a lot of time on their hands. You know, these planes that I fly on. There's a lot of people on every flight, so they're going to go through every single name. They must have a computer program. I don't know how they do it quite fr yet, yet, frankly. Or maybe they have a lot of federal civil servants sitting around just checking the manifest. I, I don't know. What do you have if somebody's named John Doe or, you know, Jane Smith? Um, how do you figure that out? I don't know. And, oh, what, by the way, they make mistakes. What a surprise. Okay. The federal government attorney in this case argued in front of the judge that even though that they have the authority to send out notices about anybody convicted of a sex offense involving a minor, regardless of whether or not they have to register, I hope you caught that part, regardless of whether or not you're currently required to register, so somebody who's no longer required to register because you actually have tiered registries at work, you know, they can still send out a notice about you. But my, federal, but my opposing counsel says, oh, but we don't do that. We have that authority, but we're not exercising that authority. And I said, really? How about John Doe number three? He wasn't required to register, hadn't been required to register for two years. You sent a notice to the Philippines that he was coming, and they denied him entry. Oh, well, we made one mistake. <laughs> like one, they're admitting to one mistake. I already have a second mistake, by the way, now, since that oral argument. Um, da, 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 da. So we, in fact, um, have submitted a petition to the State Department and Paul led a, a group of people who made phone calls to the State Department. We followed that up with a written petition. It's eight pages long and telling them about their mistakes and asking them to correct their mistakes. <coughs> I think that's, is there a next slide? Is there, is there a next slide? And that's just the information, with, including my contact information. That is my private cell phone. You can call me. If I don't answer, it's because I'm talking to somebody else usually or I'm asleep. Remember, I'm on the West Coast, you East Coast people. And that's my personal email address, and you can reach me that way as well. So I have cards. I have lots of business cards with me for here at the conference. And uh, Paul is now going to talk about the group he's put together called RTAG. And he has information about specific countries, uh, which are based upon reports made to him and to other people in that group. Yeah. Okay. 
it it's just pins on to you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, uh, real quick, my organization is called uh, Registrant Travel Action Group. Uh, we have a website now. The people I work mostly directly with uh, is uh, Ronnie from uh, Florida Action Committee and Robert, who's from uh, Arkansas. And um, the interface between us and RSOL is Brenda Jones. And uh, when this was, it was in January that we went to D.C., and it was Brenda Jones and myself who went to as many uh, uh, Congress staffers' offices that we could who had um, supported the bill, uh, co-sponsored the bill, uh, and then we tried to get into some in front of some Congress people who we could try to influence. For example, there's one gentleman who is a, has a Muslim background. Uh, and just point out the, the, the scariness of just the idea of a unique identifier. Uh, what I want to do is, um, this is my agenda that I put together. Um, I want to, first of all, just present what are the countries that we have been definitively denied and what are the countries that we have definitively been allowed to go in. And uh, the criteria that I use is um, that for allowing to go in, we know that the registrant traveled. Uh, and to elaborate on what uh, um, Janice alluded to, what they're doing uh, to determine whether registrants are traveling uh, from, a, from a process point of view is when you board the aircraft, there's an airline passenger information system manifest that's generated automatically. And any airline uh, that's departing or entering the United States or overflying the United States, the, uh, the Customs and Border Patrol requires that that commercial entity release the manifest to uh, that agency. And then from that, and it's sent electronically, from that, that is called uh, probably automatically through software uh, for anyone that's on any list, blacklist or, or watch list or terrorist watch list or no fly list. Uh, so that's what they're doing. And then the Border Patrol will send that data on to interested entities drug enforcement agency, uh, Homeland Defense for, for terrorist watch lists and uh, the Angel Watch office for traveling registrants. So that's why when you get off the airplane, we're pretty confident, almost 100%, that no matter what your status is as, as your conviction or whatever, that if you're on a registry uh, anywhere in the United States, that information is being sent to the uh, arriving country almost 100% of the time. Uh, and what has happened is some countries view it literally as the United States directing them to send you home. Or they just don't, excuse my French, give a shit. Uh, and I'm going to go, I want to go over those countries so we have that information out. Now on my website, and I need to update it because I've gotten some feedback, there's a couple of errors. I have what's called a travel matrix. And on my website, and please spread this out as much as possible, the web, website is registranttag.org. And I should have put it up on my on this slide. I apologize for that. So registranttag.org. Uh, there's a button where people can put ex send experiences, and and good or bad. I want all the information we have now. I, I have that information, and I've started putting it into a document. But we've we, the the people I've mentioned. I consider my board with with people from RSOL and some other people. I we don't think it's a good idea just to send that information out even if the emails, phone numbers, and contact names are redacted. And that mainly because there's a lot of data in there people could collate. So I've got that data. Some people have been frustrated, not many, but a couple said, well, when are we going to see the data? And because we, we need to corporately, I think, decide what we want to do with it. I already have some ideas, and I'll talk about that at the end of uh, my briefing, if you guys are still awake. Um, OK, then we'll call, I want to do a little bit of some specific country analysis. And I want to produce that analysis in, a, in some documents we can, we can send out and provide. And also for researchers uh, and people who want to present things like Janice's legislatively. Um, kind of go over some really nasty family experiences I've seen. And I'll just kind of from memory go through some. And then some of the initiatives that we're trying to. And one thing I want to add to the end of this 
is if we have time, and, and I, I want at least a couple minutes, I get a lot of emails from people, wives in the Philippines, wives in other countries, uh, and, the, and I'm not up on it as much as I could because this, as everyone knows who's an advocate, what you're doing, it takes up quite a bit of time. I'm going to introduce Alexander, uh, and he's a German um, a, a person from Germany. He's an American citizen and resident from California, and his wife is a Chinese citizen. I want to talk about fiancé visas and that process because I'd like to bring that into our tag and start working that issue too because there's a lot of leverage. And we'll, we'll try to spend, a, I'd like to spend a couple minutes on that near the end. Okay, go ahead, next slide. Okay, so, uh, and I want to kind of go through these and I want to say a couple things about the countries, but I don't want to get buried into the minutia because we could talk just about Mexico for all day and, and I, I want to get through this. So uh, these are countries you, you will almost not get into at all. Uh, we have some examples of how you can get into that, uh, and, and we can talk about maybe that a little bit, because I'd like to talk about Canada. But Canada, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Mexico, Nicaragua, and Panama, you will not get into at all. Now, I've been able to get into Dominican Republic, and I'm not quite sure why, but I think as time has gone on, I won't be able to now. I, I might have just slipped under, you know, I don't think the process has been perfect in the past. Canada, you can get what's called a letter of rehabilitation. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but there are registrants who have, uh, have been able to get that um, uh, certificate and they can travel to Canada. Matter of fact, I got an email from one guy who has been doing that and when he came across, Border Patrol just they practically gave him uh, a colonoscopy. They were just angry that, or they, he was there for four hours. They couldn't believe. He even showed his letter of rehabilitation, but they, they, were, they just didn't believe that he actually was able to legitimately go into Canada. We also have a member, Ronnie, from uh, Florida, who has a Canadian passport. So there are ways to discuss for countries as we go forward. Um, everyone knows about Mexico, and I'm going to spend a couple minutes on Mexico in a later slide because uh, we, we created a Mexico travel committee, uh, and I want to kind of focus on there because a lot of people want to travel to Mexico because it's so close. Now, countries that, have got, that we've gone to, I've gotten emails from, and uh, seem to be no problem at all is, one is Antigua. People have traveled there. It's a small island. I think the, it's a Dutch protectorate. Uh, it, there seems to be no problem with the islands of the Caribbean, which like Trinidad, Tobago, uh, or, or Dutch protectorates. They just don't, Aruba, they, they don't seem to be an issue at the moment. Uh, Bahamas, I've, I've heard people go to the Bahamas on the cruise they fly into. I haven't heard anyone yet get rejected from the Bahamas. I've traveled to Guatemala. Oh, go ahead. Well, Carnival Lines, uh, and that's probably what I should include in, in here. Uh, cruise Lines specifically, there are two. Carnival will not let you cruise with them if they are aware of your, your um, status. So it's not specific to going to, to Bahamas. <coughs> Carnival will not let you go. Royal Caribbean has a process where if they know you're a registrant, they uh, will ask you for details, and they have a security company separate that makes a determination. Uh, and then they'll tell you yes or no. As a matter of fact, Robert was a, and maybe, again, I don't want to get detailed in, into cruise lines, but do you want to speak to what happened to you with Carnival real quick? Well, I, I've, I've cruised with Carnival many times, and last week I was, uh, um, I was cruising with Carnival. My coffee? I got a call with Carnival eight So what I want to do on cruise lines, uh, and I'll just spend a couple minutes on this, is uh, get that information out to everyone and see if we can talk with Royal Caribbean and find out what process they use uh, and how they make that determination. 
And then maybe down the road, I, I've traveled on Carnival without a problem. There are people, I, I had uh, someone I got an email from as of uh, May. They went, they're from Massachusetts. They went on Carnival out of Florida and didn't have a problem. The key there is they probably just aren't aware of the individual's registration status. Um, I advise people do not call cruise lines. Someone once called Call it Carnival and asked, what's your policy? I'm a sex offender, and what, what are they going to say? Oh, thank you for the information. No, you can't go. Don't call the cruise lines. Be because the other cruise lines who may not care. Someone actually called another cruise line, I can't remember which, that allows us, and they said, oh, we don't, we go ahead and cruise. But the more we ask those questions, the more they're going, to, they're going to think about it. So I think for some crews, it's more like the less they know, they, they prefer to be ignorant on the subject. I don't know why Carnival uh, made that decision. Uh, the worst case I heard was a woman who's a registrar in California. Her conviction was some 25 years ago. She's got teenage kids and a husband, and she's cruised Carnival for years. And I don't even know what her uh, offense is. but. Um, you know, what's she going to do? Grab a teenage boy while her husband's out playing with the kids and drag him into the stateroom? And, you know, it's just it's ludicrous. She was just devastated. Her family's devastated. Uh, I don't know what we can do with a private entity, but that's something that we'll have to think about down the road. Sure. They sent me a letter. If I try to get on the again, mm -hmm. I would be denied if my money would not be required. Right. Well, that's good to know. So why waste the time? Yeah. You know, um, the... Um, I thought of maybe trying, there's different things you can do. Uh, we could talk about that offline, um, you know, how you can book your, your ticket, for example. Like one guy used just the first two letters of his first name and his wife paid for it, you know, and they went on the cruise and they had a problem. The problem with that strategy is that when you come back, you, more than likely now you're going to be pulled aside because I have, I have twice on Carnival. And uh, the Border Patrol will give a list of names to Carnival of who they want to go through extra screening. So Carnival Security will pull you aside and say, you've got to go through extra screening with, with immigration and when you get off the boat. Well, that tells Carnival right there that there's something about you. They might be informed of that decision. I've never gotten a letter from Carnival, and I, met yet, and I went on Carnival, I think, last <laughs> November. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. Um, OK, uh, Jamaica is interesting because uh, it just happened to me and two other people. Now when I go to Jamaica, uh, they pull me aside. They want to know my specific itinerary. They would say, and they've told me this three times, they'll let me stay in the country, but uh, I won't be allowed to come back next time unless um, I get off the registry. And then they say, you really need to get your country to stop sending these alerts. And that's just <laughs> straight. Yeah, yeah I would like no shit. This is just an analog thing. Uh, the, last the time before last I went there, I was uh, being uh, interrogated by a very lovely woman. She's about 55, very big woman, great accent. And she, I went through the details of my offense. And, and I, I had a girlfriend in Jamaica at the time, and, and I gave her phone number. She actually called her on the phone and uh, chatted. And then she says, OK. Um, she went through the story. She says, I'm on Mr. Regney. When I was uh, a young girl in village, she said 12 years old, she said she had an affair with a guy who was 30, 30 or 35. And she said, I still love that man. And I go to his house and I clean his house. He's disabled now and I feed him and I still love him. And then she looks at me and she says, you have a good time in Jamaica. And then she walks away. <laughs> I'm not saying that having, you know, 12, 12 year olds can't consent. I understand all that. I'm just saying that's what she, so that's just an interesting story. Uh, Guatemala, several people have. I know Jason has gone to Guatemala. I've gone to Guatemala. And at the moment, they don't seem to care. Um, some of the others over here, Nicaragua, I mean, that's just recent for Nicaragua. There's a guy who has pr property there, and he can't get back to it. Um, Panama has a law that, very similar to the Philippines, where if you've been convicted of anything of, pure, of uh, moral turpitude, right, uh, and I got pulled off a plane just transiting through to Jamaica. So you came in transit through Panama. Now, there's a way to get to Panama, and it happens all the time. People have gone to Guatemala or in, from Mexico and taken a bus through and then flown out of uh, Panama without any issues at all and even had the passport scanned at the Border Patrol. 
So it's a matter of the alerts associated with flying. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, South America. Uh, Argentina and Brazil have specific laws denying entry to registrants. Um, will, for will, anyone on a registry worldwide, which is funny because we're, besides us, Australia and the UK and a few other minor ones, we're the only ones with registries. Um, and we're the only ones sending alerts. Uh, Australia is doing it to a limited degree. Colombia, uh, this is just recent, but there have been three different people individually denied entry in Colombia. So that's information. And then this is just real recent, about two months ago, someone got denied uh, entry into Peru. And all of these are associated directly with the alerts. And I've got email after email after email where in Spanish and in English, people have been told that we got an alert from your government and says that you're going to commit a crime here. Uh, now, we got to get FOA information on all this, of course. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and you're going to commit an act in our country, and we're being directed to send you back. You know, now, it may not say that exact on the alert that, that's either a green notice or comes from ICE, but it, that's, that's the inference. And when you read the Homeland uh, Defense documents that talk about process, and these are documents I want to get up on my website, that talk about how they're going to implement process, and you look at IML itself, they'll say, well, we don't know what a country's going to do, and it's not, you know, we're not attempting to have them sent home. We're just sending out what's public information. We don't know what the other country's going to do. Bullshit. Bullshit. Okay, now, allowed entry. Many people have gone to Chile without a problem. No problem at all. Next. Now, if I miss something, a country, if you guys are aware of it, uh, no problem with, with Ecuador. No problem. Now, if there's a country up here that you do not see, the reason is I, do ha I don't have data on it. So these are only countries in which I've gotten an email, and I have a, a button on my email where you can log in your travel plans, what you've done, and we're collecting that database. And we have it, and I can release it and get it, use it, where you, uh, you go through and you tell your travel plans. So I want to know all the positive stuff, too, so we can send that country a thank you letter. No. <laughs> Okay, uh, Asia, Australia, um, there, you can actually go, get into Australia. There's a young man about three years ago who got uh, the immigration allowed him to go down and go to college for a year. Uh, but you have to apply. It's fairly rigorous. It's possible to get in the U.K. too, but you're not just going to get a visa and go. Um, China just recently, in the last year, has been turning people away. Um, there's possible to go through Hong Kong and get into China, uh, because I think, uh, Robert, you can do it with, get in there without a visa. I'm not sure. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Uh, there, was a, there was a man who's off the registry who was living in China. Uh, and he, the immigration, Chinese immigration came up, arrested him, and said, and, 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 ex, and just kicked him out of the country. And he was told by Chinese officials that they were directed by the United States government to kick him out. Uh, and that's the biggest chilling thing is the, the, our government's lying to us. What a surprise. That same person went to Thailand, got kicked out of Thailand, tracked down the ICE representative that's in the embassy. Now, ICE has representatives in a lot of countries, not all countries, but a lot of countries that they want to coordinate efforts with. That ICE agent turned around to him and he said, well, I'm not on the registry anymore. According to their documents before IML was passed, they were specifically not, they were only supposed to send alerts of those on registries. Well, this guy turned around and told the, the ICE representative, said, well, it's, it's on the, um, it, it's public information, public knowledge. So this, this guy went way and above what he's required to do. So uh, this gentleman, I can f hopefully find that email. He claims he contacted the Angel Watch office, and he got an email from them that he, they apologized, and that, that would never happen again. Uh, but anyway, but now, according to IML, if you have an offense against a child, even if you don't have to register, they still can now send the alert. So anyway. Um, uh, Indonesia's just recent. Laos uh, is recent, too. New Zealand, there's a gentleman in California who, or Arizona, I'm, I'm sorry, who was not allowed to board the airplane. New Zealand actually contacted the airline, sec the air security for the airline, told them, don't let them board the airplane because 
So he wasn't able to even board the, the aircraft, which is pretty extraordinary. Saved him some time. That's true. That's true. Uh, Jap Japan is one of the countries that collects. Well, Japan, New Zealand, and Australia, like the United Kingdom, Canada, they pull in direct uh, criminal database information from the United States. My understanding in Japan is if you have any criminal background at all, you're not going to get in. One guy was transiting through Japan, I think on his way to Thailand, and uh, they missed the flight, so they had to stay one night. The Japanese actually uh, put, he, he had to pay for a hotel. They had two guards that stood outside the hotel room overnight and escorted him back to the airplane. I mean, that's, that's freaky to me. That's uh, just absurd. Uh, and I think he had to pay for the time. I don't know. Um, now, the Philippines, we could probably spend a lot of time in the Philippines. But right now, if the Philippines, they passed the law uh, that talked about moral tur turpitude. And the head of the immigration has made a statement, any registrant anywhere in the world, once they find out that registered status will be added to the blacklist. However, we've had, had some success in the Philippines. And I'll go into that here in another, in, in another slide. Thailand is fairly recent. Um, we, we have had people travel to Thailand, no problem. Just recently, they started kicking out um, based upon the alerts. Taiwan, right now, my understanding is Taiwan is, uh, they, w they won't even consider letting you in. Uh, Vietnam is a recent uh, occurrence, too. However, we've had people travel to Vietnam as well without a problem. I should have put up Cambodia. That's one of the countries I forgot. Right now, people have traveled to Cambodia, but there have been... Um, uh, instances where they've been uh, detained and then uh, kicked out. Countries that right at the moment I, I can validate almost 100% that you sh should not have any problem at all. And that's Hong Kong, Nepal, Singapore. We've had people go to Singapore, but Janice told me uh, in Oakland that someone got ejected. I, I can't validate that. Uh, there was a gentleman who got kicked out of, out of, uh, out of the Philippines. And he flew to Singapore and was living in Singapore, not a problem. And then he went to Cambodia and had his girlfriend and his girlfriend's mother fly to, fly to Cambodia and spend time there. And I just heard recently that that man uh, passed away in Cambodia. So I, I don't know. Okay, next slide. Okay, Europe. Um, and, you know, it might be understand. We, we could start thinking about trends here because there's obvious trends that are occurring. Um, I went to Ireland and didn't have a problem, but recently, in the last six months, we've had two people denied entry into Ireland. Uh, and what Ireland told them is, if you have an offense that's, that's a year or longer, that you will not be allowed to enter Ireland. Um, Russia has a, passed a law that, I, I, I don't know if it was passed, but it was, I'm pretty sure it was passed, that anyone who's, uh, who's convicted of a sex offense throughout the world I will be denied entry into Russia for 50 years. So, so essentially, right now, Russia is probably uh, no-go. United Kingdom, one thing you need to realize that uh, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, at least for now, I'm not sure how Brexit will affect it or how, how, uh, um, um, how Scotland's departure from the UK to the European Union affects it, but that's one big immigration zone. So wherever you enter, any of those four countries, you are entering the UK customs zone. And they will enforce the laws of all those countries, or at least that's the intent. So, so if you go through, let's say you take a ferry from France to Ireland and you get in, then I believe you can travel anywhere in those countries without a problem unmolested. Uh, and you can be in Ireland for up to two months. I'm not sure about the UK. But then you can take ferries to the UK, and you should not even have to show your passport. <coughs> But I don't, I don't know, we haven't, I, I'm intrigued by the ferry route of, of things, but I, I, I think they, that's probably a closed avenue too. Um, countries that have allowed us entry, and this at the moment is, is completely validated. Uh, Germany is no problem, we have someone working in Germany. Uh, I have a member whose wife is Hungarian citizen who is working to get her husband to become a Hungarian citizen. And he's been hired by a German company to work in Germany. And she already validated that they won't, he won't have any problem living in Germany. Um, France, I mean, Jeff Epstein has a house in Paris. And he's a billionaire sex offender. Um, Hungary, you, that's, Hungary's validated. In the Netherlands, one member who's an airline pilot um, 
was uh, prepping his airplane at the airport. They were just getting fuel. He was coming through the United States. And his name is uh, Captain Mack. He lives in Dallas or Fort Worth. Uh, immigration came up. Dutch immigration came up. They had this piece of paper in hand, which was probably the alert. They chatted with him for a few minutes, and they said, okay, you know, have a safe flight, and they left. Um, Portugal, that's completely validated. There's two different families, or husband-wife combination, traveled to Portugal, uh, and uh, one guy got I, 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 not interrogated. It's like they stopped him as he's going through immigration. Oh, you missed her so Right, uh, and we got this thing from your country. Yeah, I said, how long are you going to be here? Oh, a couple of weeks. Okay. okay, have a nice journey. That was it. Um, Romania, not a problem. Spain, a uh, member in, in Pennsylvania, who's a level two, flew to Spain to test it out. He got pulled aside for about four minutes, asked about, hey, we got this thing from your country. What's this about? He told him what, he, what his offense is. Okay, what's your, what's your plans? Told him what his plans are. I said, okay, have a nice trip. You know, please don't do anything. But any and came home. Um, and the Ukraine, uh, I have validated some people had uh, traveled to the Ukraine. Now, I think there's a few Eastern European countries trickled in there. I'm not sure. Uh, I had someone say that they've gone to Bel Bulgaria without a problem. Uh, but here's the trends, and this is interesting, is, uh, you know, Ireland and the UK have uh, registries. And Ireland pretty much goes in, goes in tune of what the UK wants kind of like Mexico with us. Um, and the, the Europe thinks they're, they're crazy on this issue, like we are. Um, Russia is kind of a surprise, but the, I think it was a political thing by a far-right political uh, group that just got that passed in the Duma. Is that, do they call it the Duma now? Anyway, um, all these other countries are Europe. Schengen, if I pronounce that wrong, Schengen, Schengen countries. And most of us know what that is. It's an it's a, it's agreement signed by uh, some 30 countries in Europe, which means once you get to Europe, you can go anywhere. You can go to Scandinavia, go to Southern Europe, probably go to Mallorca, uh, Canary Islands, all, all through the Mediterranean, unmolested, completely have a, not have a problem. Um, and, and I don't foresee that changing. I, and I, I want to try to see what we can do to make sure that that doesn't change. Uh, next, uh, we've had no problem at all, none. none. Um, now, I would say if you guys know people who travel, know for no matter what the results are, please ask them to get on the website and fill it in. Uh, it's not going to waste. We collect it. We're collecting the data. We have the data, and trust me, in the future it's going to be it's going to be um, very valuable information and none of the contact information will be shared. I did make one mistake. There was a, a, a husband and wife that had, he had been kicked out of Nicaragua and they sent me the information and there's someone else who had the same problem in Nicaragua. So I gave the, the wife's email who filled out the form to the gentleman and husband and wife that had similar problems. And that woman sent me a scathing email back saying, my, and, and I probably shouldn't have done that at first, I was a little upset. I, I, I emailed her. I said, that's just another reg registrant who's having a similar problem. Uh, but I, what I have noticed is, and I'll just say this as respectfully as I can, I do get follow phone calls about, from people who believe that their problem is so unique and that I need to spend all my energies on their problem. And I, who, no, what we need to do is take your problem, and as you try to fix it, join us and help us fix it for everyone else. That's what we need, because that's going to come back to you. You know, just like Janice Lobb, I'm doing this all out of my own time. Luckily, I'm, I'm retired, and I can do it, and I'm happy to do it. I love doing it. I don't spend, frankly, as much time as I should. I get, you know, I get, I like to travel and stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there is. Oh, yeah, let me, let me get to that then. Uh, okay, is, uh, uh, is there new information about Israel? Yes. And Ronnie's been there. May, he might be able to... Oh, no, I have Okay. Um, I know of three different people, two of them Jewish, and that, I'm just saying that that might be an element, have gone to Israel without any problem, not even question. One is a guy named Bob... Uh, don't name people. Uh, don't name Okay. All right. A, a guy uh, out from the Northeast, and uh, he, he went without a problem. 
Uh, so Israel right now, best we can figure, is not a problem. And Lebanon, I can confirm, is not a problem either. Dubai, two, two people have got sent back. One guy who has family there has been able to go back to Dubai uh, because he had to get, go through the visa process and get his, uh, a, I don't know if it's a special visa, but he now can go back. Uh, South Africa, I, I've had only heard anecdotal information about South Africa, so I can't confirm it. Um, and, I, and I have no emails about it, so that's a big question mark. And one reason why I have a question mark is they have very strict sex offender laws. Uh, there was an old, a blind man who had a, an old um, um, story. You know, some countries you can't even have written material. He had a story that's like 30, 40 years old in his apartment, and he got arrested and he became a sex offender in South Africa. He's a blind guy with a story. And they just, they're, they're kind of going out of control on the issue. Next. Uh, now, country analysis. I've talked about the letter of rehabilitation. There's a process. It's on the Canadian website. Uh, I don't know what criteria they use for uh, sex offenders, but the way the Canadians apply it, they apply it to their legal system and to their standards. Um, we do have one person, Ronnie, has a Canadian passport. Uh, I don't necessarily want you to speak on the issue unless there's things you know about the rehabilitation process. Yeah, but you, you have a Canadian passport, so that's a separate. Yeah, I'm able to travel abroad anywhere. Right. Yeah, just, so one, it, one issue is if you can get a passport from another country, um, then that, that will help you out a lot. People have gone to Mexico, two different individuals are Mexican citizens. Uh, one has a Mexican passport, the other one didn't. They're American citizens with American passports. And the Mexican authorities have told them specifically, travel to this country on your Mexican passport and we don't care. Um, now, let's talk about Mexico real quick. About three years ago, in tune with the Angel Watch program, the Mexican authorities established what they called the Guardian Angel program. And it was a program, and I don't know if it was put into law. Uh, I don't know if California knows anything about it, because you guys used to have some information on your website. But the Guardian Angel program, which is a program established by immigration, with the effort of once they find out information, uh, they will not allow anyone in a co the country that's a registrant of any kind. Um, and they've actually been getting strict on some other. There, there was a, a person who had a conviction for vehicular uh, not, he, he didn't kill someone, but he went to jail because the two people were badly injured, and he did jail time, and he was deported. He wasn't allowed to come into Mexico, which is interesting. Um, there are ways to get into Mexico, uh, and Robert might be able to elaborate, where you cross the border where you don't get your passport scanned. You go there for uh, up to three days, and you stay within 20 miles of the border, and then you can exit unmol unmolested. If you choose to do that, you need to make sure you do a couple things. Tell your reporting agency and do it within 21 days because that's the requirement of IML. So even if the Mexican authorities don't know you're there, when you come across the border, they're going to be aware that you went to Mexico and they're going to try, they could very well ask your reporting agency whether you told them of international travel. Sure. Well, it's in the statement of IML. Now, let me tell you what... Uh, what um, I, I found a document that was uh, back in May, and I need to find these documents. They're buried on my hard drive. The discussion was a government document discussing how Angel Watch would coordinate with other agencies to implement IML. They said two things which was very interested. interesting. They talked about the 21 days. Would the 21 days be enforced? They said, we don't know if the 21 days is actually a statute that's required and if you violate it, you violated the law. Um, and they stated that any questions about the implementation of IML rules must be referred to to the agency that you report to. Also, they said if registrants contact you, i.e. Angel Watch or any other government agency, they are specifically to tell the registrant they're not qualified to speak about the law that they're supposed to enforce, that they don't really understand it, basically, is what they're saying. And they're also saying... Uh, that um, that you're supposed to get a lawyer and then tell what our agency is supposed to do. So, for example, I'm in Texas. That tells me I go to Texas, whatever they tell me to do, I do. I would say as a minimum, make sure you tell them that you travel. I, so. I'd like to add my two cents to that. Sure.
Okay, my two cents is this. Even lawyers don't agree about the 21-day notice. So um, I'm the president, and my vice president and I, we're both lawyers, we don't agree. Um, so IML, what it says is that it's amending SORNA. So what happens if you're a non-SORNA state? And so, you know, I, I know everybody wants very specific answers. We don't have very specific answers. And so this is what I tell people when they call me. How much risk are you willing to take? I, I'm serious. How much risk are you willing to take? Are you willing to go without giving somebody 21 days notice? If you are, just be ready that you might have to spend 10 years in prison. That's the penalty for not sending 21 days notice if you are required to give 21 days notice. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a huge penalty. By the way, the U.S. Supreme Court talked about the 21-day notice in the Nichols case, okay? Mr. Nichols, who went from Kansas to the Philippines without telling anybody he was going, he wasn't on parole, he wasn't on probation, he just decided he'd had it with the United States for some reason, and he just went to the Philippines. And our country went to the Philippines and took him back. And the U.S. Supreme Court decision was that he did not violate a United States law at that time by going to the Philippines without notice. They left open whether or not he violated Kansas state law. And then there was dicta, just you know, talking in the case, that said that they thought that IML was going to solve that problem and that everybody would have to give 21 days notice. Yes, sir. Well, let me share a California experience with a registrant who was not, who was risk adverse, and what did he want to do? So he decided he was going to give 21 days notice. He found a form online, it's a federal form of giving notice, okay? He sent it to a federal official who said, I don't want it, don't give it to me. And he's like, but you're the person, no, I'm only receiving that information from state law enforcement. So I'm not going to receive it from a registrant. By the way, I tried to send it to him for another client. They said, no, I'm not taking it from lawyers either. So you give it to your local law enforcement. So he went to his local law enforcement, and they said, what am I supposed to do with this? And he said, would you please just keep it in my file? And they said, okay. And he had them stamp a copy so that he had a copy with him as well. But there's a lot of uncertainty. I hope that's what you all are getting from this. There's a lot of uncertainty about the 21-day notice. There's a lot of uncertainty about places where you travel. You know, what Paul, the information Paul is sharing with you today is based upon reports and anecdotes. It's not law. You know, I will tell you when it, goes to, when it comes to Mexico, I tell people don't bother to go to Mexico. And this gentleman that I mentioned in my presentation who went to, uh, tried to uh, enter Mexico, and he'd been doing it for years, at least three years since he moved there, he was going through one of these border checkpoints walking. He was not flying. And that was a new experience for him, totally caught him up short. And so, but the other thing I hope you understand, if you haven't heard these stories before, is that you travel to these countries, this could happen to you, you spend your time, you spend your money, and you get there and they're not letting you in the country. Whether it's Mexico or the Philippines or Canada or any other places, you do not get an advance notice. And that's why I think, too, and we do have due process in our lawsuit saying, wait a minute, if you're going to send out notices to the country, the least you can do is send notice to the registrant, too. Because in some situations, and this happened, one gentleman, I know he was traveling with seven other people, right? And, and he gets there and they deny him. And this is going into Mexico. And later he told me that how he explained it to his friends was he told his friends, oh, I have an old drug offense. 
And for him, that was acceptable. He didn't want his friends to know he'd been convicted of a sex offense. It was a drug offense. But I, and I don't know if that same fellow that you're talking about tried to go into the United Arab Emirates. You know, he was going back to visit family, right? And yeah. he took his mother-in-law, and he had his wife and the kids and yeah. stuff like that. And all the you know extended family was waiting for him in the United Arab Emirates, and they would not let him into the country. So that cut that um, uh, family had to make an immediate decision who goes and who stays. As it turned out in that situation, as reported to me, is he came back to the United States and the rest of his family went. Another situation, this was just last month in August, a man from Chicago contacted me and said that he had gotten a job in Mexico as a minister. Okay, he turned his life around and, and, and you know, and he got a job. He was a minister and he got a job in Mexico. He and his family sold everything they owned in Chicago. They got on that airplane to go to Mexico and he was denied entry. Now, for whatever reason, his family ended up spending a week in Mexico. He had to get sent back immediately, and he did have the church that wanted to hire him, I believe, took care of his family for a week, but there's no guarantees, folks. There are no guarantees. You can lose a lot of time and a lot of money going on a vacation or to visit relatives, or what if you want to just go for a cultural experience? You've never seen the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? You want to see that for some reason. It's on your bucket list, right? You need to check things out. You need to know what the risks are, and then you need to calculate for yourself, your family, your friends, whoever you're traveling with, what your level of ri what level of risk you're willing to accept and live with. Let Based upon what you said, I kind of having trouble piecing this together here. It, okay, in Indiana where I live, you're supposed to give 10 days notice, but you're supposed to give, you're supposed to give an, an itinerary, okay? So is that required by I have? You're, you're supposed to give them, uh, yeah, the itinerary. So what, 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 what's so your I'm flight gonna, number and, and what, where you plan on being? So if I'm going to go there and then use that as a jump off point to go to some of these other countries, like you well, that, I, right, right. I, well, what, what I recommend is just tell them I'm going to be in Hong Kong for two weeks. And then from there, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't really. Do you have an answer to that question? Well, I, I, the answer I have is this. Supposedly the stamp on the passport is going to stop that. And they talked about it, including the, the federal government in the case, that that is supposed to prevent what you just said. I guess hop, skipping, jumping, yeah. whatever, that you go into country A where it's totally allowed and then you go to country B. And, and think about it. If you were to go, let's just say Italy, I'm Italian. So you go to Italy, by the way, they'll welcome you. Ah, buongiorno, come on, have some pasta, eat, drink some of our wine. Um, and, you know, and they don't care if you're a registered citizen and go visit Italy, they don't. But then what if you want to go from Italy to, some, uh, to England? Okay, I guess based upon anecdote, you can just hop on a train and go to England. But if you if you have the stamp on your passport, supposedly it's to stop that from happening. So when you got to England, assuming somebody looked at your passport, yeah, you do take some risk. That, now that let let me out. think. This is just let me say two things about the 21 day. One is uh, and the process and what they're going to enforce. Um, I, I had this long conversation with a guy who was trying to get back into Nicaragua. Uh, and, and he was yelling at me because I told him what I think he should do. He, he, he's from Texas, or I think it's Texas. Anyway, it's a non sort of state. He said, well, I could give them five, they don't care. I said, fine, give them five day no notification. But then you, you potentially have violated IML. I know what he's trying to do was limit the amount of time for the notification. But here's the thing. I know, I mean, I was pulled off the airplane in Panama transiting to Jamaica from Dominican Republic. So they pulled me, and I saw a piece of paper. So they got an alert, and it was only like within two days or whatever. So what I told them, dude, when you, when you book the flight or when you get on the airplane, it's going to be, the angel watch is going to know, and it's, it's a simple email or fax. So why, why, you, why put yourself, if the country's going to know either way, why not tell 21 days in advance? So it's really a... a and he, he was arguing with me. I said, dude, do, but my, I said, do what you want. I'm just providing you information. I, I was getting pissed. I said, dude, you know, he kept on telling me I'm wrong. I said, I'm, yeah, Paul's willing to do things I'm not willing to do as a lawyer. <laughs> yes, sir. One of the most confounding things about these particular forms of regulation for me is the question of what happens when inevitably travel plans change. I know we're required to make the notifications, but say, 
planes change, hotels change, uh, you don't arrive at the right time for things, stuff like that. Is that part of what your requirement is? And if it is, for instance, say, mm -hmm. I end up in somewhere too longer than I thought, it doesn't accord to what I, am I then now liable <laughs> under these laws I, I, having broken? I don't think they know. All the law requires you to do is report 21 days in advance. Well, that's not and my question is Well, they, I, I guess the answer, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. What I did, I, I was going to Dominican Republic, right? And now the 21 day advance notice. And I just email uh, the head of Dallas. And, uh, and whenever I want to travel, that's what I do. So 21 days before I was going to go to Dominican Republic, I uh, emailed her. And they don't follow the 21 days. They, they don't really care, but they do tell the Marshal Service. I know that much. So she said, I didn't have my itinerary. I said, said, I'm just going to fly on this flight. I didn't know where I was going to stay. And she said, well, you, when you have that information, let me know. Actually, all she had was the date, because we passed that information on to Marshal Service. So at, in other words, her message to me was, as you get more information, let us know. So I was going to try to take a ferry across from Puerto Rico, but they, the ferries don't, don't go up until June. So I booked a flight, and I passed that flight to her in an email a few days later, right? But Paul's circumstances are way different than California. California does yeah. not have email notice. So if you're in the middle of your trip Well, and that's just, a problem. Right, right, yeah, right. I, right. How I do you get that information? I'm sensitive and... and I think that's even a problem inside the United States. Like well, that... The yeah, 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 yeah. These kind of travel requirements seem a little yes. bit crazy in the sense that... Well, yeah. Well, okay, okay you know what? But, but maybe you can think about it and compare it to failure to register in the United States, okay? And so failure to register really and you know is it going to be this number of days is it going to be that number of days if i sp in california right now we have some terrible uh, terrible um, series of cases it used to be as long as you didn't spend overnight someplace you didn't have to register there but now they're saying oh no if you spend a significant amount of time and there's a man who was a caretaker for an elderly disabled woman and because he was there six hours a day they were telling him he had to register at her house too he he never spent the night there. The only reason he spent time at that house was to give her care. And they're telling him he has to register there. So I'm very afraid. And and again, he his uh, the law enforcement was being kind and that they didn't immediately violate him for failure to register. But I've heard some horrific stories about people who have been violated for nothing more than that. I have a client right now, for example, who is uh, who was going to his aunt's house because she needed some help and he was going there a few hours a day and every once in a while she said well would you stay and watch a movie with me okay he never spent the night at her house same town and the and per, um, sorry law enforcement was telling me he was going to have to register there yes in regards to where somebody sleeps at what point does it trigger you have to register that. And we actually were able to negotiate a much better, less ambiguous, and something where you had to spend a certain number of days a year or months <coughs> even to be able to get to that threshold. So, uh, you, you know, if you just put again, sometimes when you work in the legislature, put again, your, uh, put aside your anger and, and at least negotiate something that, and then they will, a lot of days be happy to work with you on it because they're going to go, hey, yeah, you're right. If we can find this better, then we'll have better cases. Yeah, the cops don't even know, right? right, right. Yeah. Uh, but as Catherine said in her presentation earlier today, she talked about vagueness as being a legal challenge to legislation. And so certainly that's something, um, I'm sure we have vagueness somewhere in our IML complaint. I think we <laughs> have at least seven, if not eight or nine com claims in there. But something to be more specific now about the notice. What information is required? When is it required? And oh, by the way, what if you're not a SORNA state? Yeah. Yes. Um, the 21-day notice, that's all well and good if you're having planned travel. What happens if you have an emergency, you have a death, and you need to go somewhere? Um, there's, you know, that's really big. How do I deal with that? Uh, I would say at least give them whatever notice that you can yeah. give and then explain the circumstances. And heaven forbid, they might want a death certificate if your relative dies. 
I know some kind of proof. I, I think you know too. It's it's like with uh, failure to register. At least some departments, police departments, some judges are willing to look at intent. Was there an intent to deceive, or did you just not know? Yes, sir. local law enforcement wherever you register on an annual basis the federal government does not have a registry supposedly um, I say that because look at nsopw.org sometime or gov sorry gov nsopw um, a call that I got from that minister that was denied entry into Mexico living in Illinois where he didn't have to register but he had been convicted in Florida Right, and he wasn't on the Florida website, Megan's Law website either. I looked, but I found him on nsopw.gov. Yes, Lloyd. Yeah, it, it's interesting because our state doesn't have that in Florida, so they don't do the 21 day things. There's no big to report it to because they wouldn't know what to do with it. But my other question was, and I may have been buried in the computer and missed it, did you guys differentiate between how this affects people on the registry versus people that have a conviction that are now off the registry? Well, I yeah. passed over it quickly, but I want to elaborate because I, I will tell you that it's a huge, huge problem, potential problem anyway. Again, the federal government in our lawsuit is saying they have the authority given to them by the International Megan's Law to send notices to countries to which you travel internationally, even if you're no longer required to register. They say they have that authority. They also say they're not exercising it. But as I said, I caught them in at least one mistake. And think about this. I mean, this just boggles my mind. In California, we have a lifetime registry for virtually all. There's this little tiny provision called Certificate of Rehabilitation. Very few people are eligible for it. And of the very few who are eligible, even fewer get it, okay, because it's a discretionary decision made by a state judge who faces reelection. Okay, just a minute, Larry. And so when that happens, to get a Certificate of Rehabilitation, you have to walk on water. Alex right here by the way walks on water he got a certificate um, last month so congratulations Alex right. however comma under the IML they can send, still send notices about him to other countries because he was convicted of a sex offense involving a minor they could still they can still well, I, okay, they say they're not doing it, but they did do it. John Doe yeah. number three in my case had not been required to register for two years. By the way, he got an expungement everything, and they still sent the notice. So in California, to get a certificate, you have to provide all kinds of evidence, letters, psychological evaluations, all these things. It is not an easy thing to do. And can you imagine, we've got the federal government now that's looking at no evidence. They're looking at no evidence. All they're looking at is one day you were convicted of an offense. That's all they're looking at. And they're saying, okay, we've decided to send a notice about you. And we're not telling you that we sent the notice either. Yeah. Uh, go, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, the ILM in general, have you addressed or maybe trying to address the fact that how can they, how can they take an otherwise valid passport and revoke it completely? I mean, if they're going to put a mark on a fine and reissue it, because Congress said they could so that but I want to distinguish for people and, and anybody who's asked me or I've just told them if you don't already have a passport go get a passport today okay and the reason is that under the law the IML it says that the State Department may not issue a passport to a covered sex offender without that identifier you may a new one a new passport on the other hand it says that they may they're not required but they may do it if they wish revoke existing passports my guess and it's not m anything more than a guess is it's going to take them a lot longer to revoke passports than it is to it, you know start adding it to the new ones i'm still trying to throw my body over the railroad tracks here folks i don't want any passports to ever have that identifier in it but i can't promise you uh, but we're still working on the strategy of how we're going to try to stop it in a different way but but that's a difference and so yeah they're going to revoke them how are they going to revoke them i know somebody 
that reported to Paul that this one person in the State Department said, oh, you're going to get a letter and it's going to be this nice orderly fashion. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. That's what I was assuming was going to happen. But I know some people on our own website have said, oh, my God, I'm really concerned. I'm going to be in the middle of an international trip and my passport gets revoked and all of a sudden I'm a person without a country. I don't know. Yes. Well, I'm glad you brought that up <laughs> because the argument that the most important argument we are making in the lawsuit is something called compelled speech. Okay, compelled speech is part of the First Amendment. It's not the part of the First Amendment most people think of. Most of the time people think, I want to say something, but I can't say something, and therefore it's First Amendment. But the other uh, side of that coin is if the government makes you say something when you don't want to say it. So today passports, tomorrow's driver's license, could be license plates. We don't know what's going to come next. And also with regard to the passports and identifiers, today it's registrants. Tomorrow is it Muslims. The after that is it gays, drunk drivers. Who knows? It's really a slippery slope. There are, there are, uh, yes, on uh, Alabama driver's licenses, yeah. and I've seen one of them in Florida. Okay, and so I know in Alabama specifically there's a case pending right now where, in fact, they're challenging that terminology on the, li on the driver's license. I don't know if they'll be successful or not. I just found out about the case, and my legal assistant's finding out who the lawyer is so I can reach out to that person and offer my help. Sir, I think the one in the back, the gentleman in the back, back. Yeah, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in some of our actions that we're doing. Uh, that's good. Let me, um, we've already talked about favorite experiences. I want to get to the end of mine because I know you guys are really love my information. Well, I want to give more time for questions. So let me run through the last slide real quick. I got the next, yeah, next slide. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we have a Mexico travel committee started. We had a teleconference call. I've got a guy who's leading it. And the objective is, is to expand it to other other areas, uh, specifically Asia and expand to Latin America, uh, and then anywhere else that we need. Uh, I have a person identified also to uh, focus on Europe. And what are we going to do? First of all, get information, understand what's going on in those countries, understand what's going on in Mexico. Another thing is to start a conversation at some level. I have no idea how we're going to do this. I really don't. But we want to start a conversation with the Justice Department in Mexico and, and the immigration in Mexico. For example, the Justice Department has stated in Spanish, officially, at least not through a press release, but to a reporter, that in fact, they, uh, they consider that there are cases in which people can travel from Mexico on travel which is legitimate. Now, what does legitimate mean? We have no idea. But we'd like to explore that. You know, are there ways that we can work with, first of all, at least emphasize to them that the alert is broad and it doesn't mean anything about the risk level of the individual. Second, are they violating laws in Mexico? Now, the next thing would be, of course, to get legal representation in Mexico. That would, that would have to be fundraising with some money. So we're not going to even start that until we get our, our, our stuff together and we have a process. And I don't want to give money to a country and they just keep it because that's happened to people in the Philippines and a couple other countries. The lawyer didn't do anything. They just kept the money. So we got to work that issue. But another thing is, is engaging the human rights organizations. So for example, uh, in Europe, uh, the British have a registration process, right? And uh, what's good about the process is it's mandated by the judge to decide at the court when the sentencing what the criteria should be and he has guidelines. And it's from they don't have to be on the registry to they have to be on the registry for five years, 10 years, and life. Now, for some really heinous cases, there were some gentlemen who were on, on the uh, registry for life in the United Kingdom. They submitted a complaint to the Human Rights Court of Europe, and it was in their favor, and the decision was that it's a human rights violation to not allow someone with lifetime registration not to have a process 
in which they can deregister. So England had to, because at the moment, before Brexit, uh, they had to scramble to come up with a process to allow lifetime registrants to, to uh, deregister. And they also had to apply it, or at least consider applying it, to all other registrants, uh, even if it's five years, ten years. Uh, and that was a court case in their favor. So I can see where on the international side, if we can engage internationally with human rights organizations, we can maybe get some decisions that affect our registry. Now, for the most part, the United States, being the nice fascist empire we are, we don't care about other countries and other courts. However, we can at least get them some decisions. How does this apply to the application of International Megan's Law? Well, specifically, we ought to petition and send complaints to the human rights courts. So, for example, Ronnie, uh, we haven't heard a response, and maybe Ronnie can speak to it. I think we had two complaints, maybe, maybe more, at least two people wrote complaints to the United Nations uh, Human Rights Court. And here's the three main courts uh, up here. There's actually an inter eight American uh, court that's based, uh, it's in New York, but it's based in Costa Rica, Costa Rica. Everyone's a member except for the United States and Canada. But you can make complaints to, uh, to that Human Rights Court and just see if they make a decision. We got to get organized I, so we have a good process, maybe some legal understanding, what parts of their declarations may apply, but we need to work that. And we need to start getting some complaints in front of them. Um, the, other, the other agency is the United Nations. So I think on all, these, on, on all these issues for all the countries we've gone to, we start writing complaints to the United Nations uh, Human Rights Commission. Um, so that's one of the things that this committee is going to focus on. Um, now, Europe probably doesn't have, isn't a big player, because there's one particular problem with this. You still have to go to the country that uh, did you wrong and work with that country to, uh, to have it corrected uh, within their legal system. So that's, a, that's an obvious challenge. But that's something that we have to do and we need to implement for all the countries that, that we're talking about. Um, engage foreign immigration attorney general. So I want to do that for Thailand, the Philippines, uh, uh, Mexico, some of the other countries that we used to travel to, we want to travel to, and suddenly just because the alerts, we're not allowed to go there. Uh, and, and I mean, that's a due process issue. And, and guess what? All these human rights courts in the declarations which the United States has signed, due process is one of the things that you're guaranteed. And if your you, human rights, if your due process is violated, then you can, you can maybe get, we can possibly get a positive declaration from that particular court. Um, I've already talked about that, and, and we're working this. I want an interactive map. Uh, that takes a lot of work, but we'll get to that where as people have these experiences, you can click on the country and just small verbiage of some of the experiences, no names or anything, of uh, people, you know, I traveled there and got turned away. Because what's interesting is there are some countries, for example, England, where you cannot go in that country if you have a conviction that, that led to your sentence being longer than, I think, 30 months. Uh, which means, but, but they told me I, I had to apply for a visa, right? That might be a way that you can go to the UK if you're interested, but we'll have to get to each individual country and try to figure that out. Maybe we could talk to Mexico and they can say, well, if they can show that they're low risk and they, I don't want to throw other people on the bus, but if we can get them to at least step up to the plate and say within all laws, here's criteria that you can give the country, then we can get that on the website and then we can have a committee for Mexico, Latin America, Asia, Europe, where people can plug into and follow that process. That's my objective. Uh, and then a travel guide is eventually get all this data information and produce a document, a PDF people can download that will be a guideline to International Megan's Law and registered travel. I want to get to that. And that's going to be a lot of work, but, but we'll get there. Well, and I would advise everybody, too, when it comes to something like a travel guide, this changes daily. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, based upon calls that Paul gets, the calls that I get, people who are writing into your website, writing into our, webs our website. So, you know, if you think about it, you have to give 21 days notice, and then many of us book, you know, international travel many months ahead of time. And then by the time, maybe after you've booked your travel, the, the circumstances have changed. So just please know that there is a lack of certainty here. We're not trying to confuse you. <laughs> We're just trying to change, tell you this is, these are dynamic times and that uh, things keep changing. Are there any other questions out there? Yes, sir. Yeah, 
Okay, so the question is, are there any precedents to the addition of a conspicuous, unique identifier to the passport of an American citizen? The answer is no. And historically, looking at the entire world, there are only two countries that have ever done this historically. One of them is Nazi Germany, and there was a big red J added to the passports of Jews, and, I ha and I've seen a co uh, an example of that. I've also been reported communist Russia also added something to the passports of their Jewish citizens. I have not seen an example of that yet. <coughs> it, it truly is, and that's why we are doing everything we can think of to stop the first passport from ever being stamped. I mean, once that happens, how do you close the floodgates? Yeah. I'm, I'm very, very afraid. And, you know, one of the plaintiffs in my case is from Iran, and he was born in Iran. He's been in the United States since he was eight years old. His parents divorced. He and his mother moved to the United States. He's been here ever since then. And he basically said that if he, and, and his dad now is elderly, and, you know, someday he's thinking he wants to be there with his father on the deathbed and not only that but he says in order to claim his inheritance from his father he has to be physically present and present in Iran in Iran a sex offense is a capital crime he will he said if I go I have to make this decision do I basically set myself up for the possibility of being murdered upon arrival in Iran? Do I let my father die without ever seeing him again? Do I give up my inheritance because I can't go back? I think there's a gentleman there. Yes, sir. Good. Good. I would I would say that uh, that can be very useful, but the anecdotal information I have is that the, what they understand and know is completely contrary con contrary to what you'll probably experience when you enter, uh, because they they don't really talk to immigration or the border patrols of their mm -hmm. particular countries. They just don't. They just know that what their immigration laws are. And most uh, there's so many countries: Thailand, Mexico, Mexican consulates in Texas said. You all have no problem, and they just, they were either lying or they just didn't know. I would say it's very useful, but it, it probably will not be consistent with what you can expect the result to be. Okay, one final question, and then our panel time is over, but Paul and I will both be available afterwards to I, I answer would, questions. Can we have Al ask Alexander to speak for just a few minutes? Oh, Alex? Alex. Do you want to come up? Yeah. And this is based on... Uh, well, you can speak. It has to do with fiancé visas. And yeah, it's, it's not only fiancé visas, but it is... Uh... Yeah, in my case, it's actually uh, my wife, who uh, uh, we've been married for 11 years, and she cannot get her green card because she's a Chinese citizen, and I was... Um, uh, we, it was deemed that we we're an Adam Walsh Act. Now, um, who of you is familiar of Title IV of the Adam Walsh Act? Very few people, yeah, and that yeah. is very interesting because um, what, when we're talking about SORN, we're talking about the first title of Adam Walsh Act. There's a fourth title of Adam Walsh Act that prevents people who have been convicted of a certified offense against a minor, or a specific offense against a minor, to be the petitioner for a beneficiary for the green card of a family member. And that's me. Um, and a lot of other people. So... Um, to just briefly explain what, what, what that means is that um, you have to, as the petitioner now, to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that you pose no risk to the beneficiary. And um, as far as, as, so how can you prove something? I mean, this is minority report. How can you prove something that's not going to happen, in the, is or is not going to happen in the future? And the burden of proof is on yours, on you, beyond any benefit of the doubt. And um, that actually ties into the IML in some way because there are several uh, registrants who have fiancés over, for instance, in China or in the Philippines, whatever, and they cannot even see um, even, or ev even their wives, and their wives cannot come over. So, for instance, my wife, if she were to leave the country now, um, she cannot ever come back. 
So she would basically self-deport. We just got another intent of denial uh, from USCIS, from the immigration, uh, that was saying, okay, well, you have to prove it that you're not, not any risk. Well, I got a certificate of rehabilitation, and my immigration lawyer says, if we don't get a Adam Walsh waiver, nobody will. Nobody will. Uh, but still, I am, I'm playing it safe, putting all my ducks in a row, and I'm getting all kinds of risk assessments again and again and again. Um, but what that means is it really splits families up, and that is one of the key ideas of these whole sex offender uh, uh, registries and of sex offender laws, to disenfranchise sex offenders and to break families apart, and they're, uh, they're really doing a good job. So um, what uh, Paul is doing with the... Um, with travel with the travel action um, actually I will be um, working with Paul um, to identify others that have that same problem who have a either a fiance or a wife who is uh, not an American citizen and cannot get the green card or American citizenship and um, I want to identify these people get together and form another committee where we all go possibly actually become uh, go to the media and or create our own media campaign and put the wives and their and and the fiancés on camera and saying hello folks is this right because I'm sure that the majority of the American population even if even here in this room a lot of people did not know about title four guess who knows about title four in the, in the general population probably very little people and mind you, probably lawmakers as well. So that's the uh, other. Uh, um, right. That's and the and other. Uh, I, I I get so many emails. I just haven't had time to work on it. There's like three or four different gentlemen who think that their problem is like everything, and they've been upset with me because I haven't really organized much in this area. I've wanted to. It's just getting time. Plus, def defrain from other things. So I think the sweetest thing is, to, let's create a separate organization. We can work very closely together as one organization at first and then because you'll you'll need separate funding etc that needs to be separated and that this will come under this effort so I just want to inform people that so and if you have any questions about this about title four talk to me later <laughs>